Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The theme for today's meditation is entitled, Serving Where God Puts You. It's based on the gospel lesson for this day from Matthew chapter 13. Here again, that word of God. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So far, our text. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, if you look at the church calendar, you'll see that there are many festivals and remembrances of saints' days where the church looks back and gives thanks to God for faithful individuals who shared the gospel and worked in the ministry that Christ had given them. And October 23rd happens to be the festival of St. James the Just, or also he's known as St. James of Jerusalem. But like many of the other individuals who are on the calendar, <clears throat> we're not always as Christians familiar with who these people are and all the things that they did. Who is this St. James of Jerusalem anyway? He's not one of those famous disciples or those characters in the scripture that seem to rise to the top in terms of teaching and people's knowledge concerning them? Who is this St. James of Jerusalem? Well, our text tells us who he is. He is the brother of Jesus. So that we don't confuse him with James, the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee, or James, the son of Alphaeus, the text tells us he is the brother of Jesus. That brings about a good deal of speculation from those who have studied the scriptures. What does that word brother mean? Because there are some in the history of the church who want to protect and defend the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary. They can't possibly conceive for themselves that Mary and Joseph, as a married couple, had normal relations that produced children. So they say, well, that word must mean cousin, or perhaps it's a, an adopted relative. And they talk about things like, well, maybe these were kids from a previous marriage that Joseph had, and they were raised in the household with Jesus. Or maybe these are kids from a, a relative of Joseph or Mary who lost their parents, and they are brought into the household of Joseph and Mary and are raised by Joseph and Mary as if they were brothers and sisters to Jesus. But since the scriptures tell us about the virginity of Mary, the virgin birth, that Joseph did not know her until after Jesus was born, the most likely explanation is, is that these are the children of Joseph and Mary, <coughs> half-siblings to Jesus, if that's what you want to call them, and they're all raised in the same household. So James, the brother of Jesus, gets to experience, at least in his lifetime, the life of Jesus in the household, what it's like to be raised in the household with the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And you would think that because God has accomplished this miracle in the salvation of his creation, sending his son in the human flesh, that the people of Joseph and Mary's household would be supporters of Jesus, believers in Jesus, those who were willing to encourage the ministry of Jesus. But they're not. St. John writes in his gospel, the seventh chapter, James did not 
believe in Jesus. He was a rank unbeliever. He was someone who was <clears throat> not in the household of faith. He may have gone to the synagogue, to the feasts with his family, but as of yet he did not understand who his brother was and what his brother had come to do. In fact, James, along with the rest of the family, are spoken of in the Gospel of Mark as those who think that Jesus is delusional, that he's nuts, that he's crazy, that he's lost his mind. And their care and concern for Jesus is this far. We need to get him out of there before somebody puts him to death. He doesn't know what he's talking about. That's how rank of an unbeliever James was concerning his brother. Now Jesus recognizes this. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, in his own home. One time in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is teaching and a message is brought to him. Your mother and your brothers are here. They want you to come outside. At that point, Jesus says, well, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? These are my mother and brothers and sisters. The ones who are hearing the word of God, they're part of my family. The ones who are believing, they're part of my family. I may have a biological connection to these folks that are outside, but it leads to the same teaching of Jesus that you and I know. If anyone loves father or mother more than me, or brother or sister more than me, he's not worthy of me. Jesus, by that action, identifies that at this time, his mother, his brothers, his sisters have taken the position that Jesus is out of his mind, and they do not believe that he is the Christ. Now, certainly in this household, they would have known the family story, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they have heard from their father and their mother, oh, the night in which Jesus was born? The shepherds came, the angels witnessed to the birth. They would have heard how Herod wanted to kill Jesus and they had to go to Egypt. They would have heard about the gifts that those visitors from the east brought. They would have heard how Jesus, when he was 12 years old, in the temple plainly said, I must be about my father's business. They would have heard these things. They would have experienced some of these things. They would have known some of these things. And yet it's apparent from the Gospels that James and the rest of the family rejected that witness. They rejected what Jesus said about himself. They were on the same page as those in the synagogue, those in the town of Nazareth. Isn't this the carpenter's son? He's just a, a common boy that grew up here. We know about him and his family. He's not anything special. How does he get this wisdom? Where does he get this education from? How can he do these mighty things? And though the wisdom of God that flows from the mouth of Jesus and the mighty works that he has done seem to have no effect in this place, we're given the reason why. And Jesus did not do many mighty things among them because of their unbelief. Now before we get too condescending in our opinion of St. James of Jerusalem, we have to remember that you and I came into this world the same way. Dead in our trespasses and sins, unbelievers, rejecters of God's mercy, until God in his mercy came to us in word and sacrament and ripped us out of eternal death and brought us into everlasting life. So what was it for James? How did the mercy of God work in the life of James? 
How did one who is obviously witnessed to in the New Testament Gospels as a doubter, a scoffer, an unbeliever, come to be the first bishop of the church in Jerusalem, come to be one who, as we heard in our first lesson today, was concerned about the witness to the Gentiles, about making sure that they heard the good news of Jesus, about his salvific work. Well, the Apostle Paul gives us a clue to that in his letter to the Corinthians. He's speaking about the resurrection appearances of Jesus, how he appeared to the women in the garden, how he appeared to his disciples in the upper room, how he appeared to more than 500 at one time, and Paul says, and Jesus appeared to James. Jesus appeared to his brother James. James was a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. James fully appreciated now what Jesus had to accomplish, how he came into Jerusalem triumphantly only to be rejected by his people. He appreciated now how Jesus had to suffer and to die upon the cross. And he saw the miracle of God's work of salvation because he witnessed his brother, who was dead, is now alive. His brother, who is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Well, you say, that's nice. That's nice. James got to experience the resurrection. But maybe we identify a little bit more with Thomas. Unless I put my fingers in the nail prints in his hand. Unless I put my hand into his side where the spear was thrust, I will not believe. You might be saying to yourself, what's my resurrection experience? You have one. You most certainly have one. You came to the waters of holy baptism dead, an enemy of God, consigned to eternal wrath. And this is what the scriptures say happened to you. You were baptized into Christ's death. You were buried with him. And as Jesus was raised by the glory of the Father, so also you should walk in newness of life. You have been a participant in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No matter where an individual is in this world, the word of God comes to them in the waters of holy baptism, brings them out of eternal death into everlasting life. It's just as if they were like James. We have experienced the resurrected Christ. We have life in this one who died for us. That's how God is with us sinful human beings. As you study the prophets, the apostles, as you look at the major and minor characters throughout Holy Scriptures, those who seem to be part of the story for a long period of time or those who seem to pass through briefly. You see, they are average, normal people. They have all kinds of vocations. They live in all kinds of different places. They have all kinds of different experiences. But their commonality is they are sinners saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are ripped out of eternal death, set on the pathway of everlasting life. And God uses them wherever he puts them to serve his kingdom for the time in which God determines so that other people may also hear the blessed word. Here is this scoffer, this unbeliever, this one who doubted, 
now as a believer called to serve as the bishop of the church in Jerusalem. He was in the war zone. He was in the place where there was vitriol and anger and bitterness, rioting in all manner of action against those who shared the good news. The Bible doesn't tell us much more about St. James. We have his witness in the epistle of James, a witness that speaks of salvation by God's grace through faith alone, a witness that says that faith is living, that faith responds to God's mercy, that faith works for the kingdom, that faith witnesses to what God has done. And the only other reference that we have in history, besides those in the book of Acts, where Paul and Barnabas are sent with James' blessings and the blessings of the council in Jerusalem to share the message of salvation with the Gentiles, the only other reference in history comes from a Jewish historian, Josephus, who tells us that in 62 AD, because he was a firm confessor of the faith, because he was a preacher of the resurrection, because he pointed to Jesus Christ as the only savior of the world, that St. James of Jerusalem was put to death by the Sadducees, by the enemies of the gospel, by those who didn't believe in the resurrection, by those who hated Jesus Christ. And the words of his brother rang ever true the world will hate you because it hated me first. So what's your field of service and mission? Where has God put you to be a witness to the gospel? To stand with firmness in the Holy Spirit against the world, the devil, and sinful flesh? to speak of things that make no sense to human reason, but things that are true nevertheless. That God in his mercy has come to save his people. That God has invested in those things which he has given us, the power of salvation. That simple water united with the power of God's word to wash away sins. That constant proclamation of faithful preachers that assure us, that comfort us, that tell our consciences that are burdened, don't be afraid, your sins are forgiven you. That simple bread and wine, used according to Christ's command, with the assurance that this is his body, this is his blood, given and shed for us, that we might have forgiveness, life, and salvation. Like James, we can set aside human reason, the philosophies of the world, the constant accusations, trials and tribulations that come against us because we are Christians. We can hear what Luther says when he asks, are you a father, mother, son, daughter, master, mistress? What's your place? Where has God put you to serve? Are you to teach your children? Are you to witness to your co-workers? Are you to, to the world give a witness of faithful marriage? God has asked you to serve where he puts you. And though your story and my story might be just like James, things of which we are ashamed, like Peter, times when we have denied the faith because we are sinful human beings, yet God still uses us. And for that, we give thanks to God. For that reason, we have these festivals marking saints' days, not because they are holier than we are, not because they are more faithful than we are, but because we recognize 
that throughout the history of the church, there have been faithful people in every age, living in every place that God has put them, that are willing to witness to what Christ has done. Jesus may not have found very much honor at all in the household that he was raised, in the town where he grew up. But thanks be to God that that stubborn hard-heartedness for many of them was turned to faith and joy after they witnessed the death of the Son of God, the resurrection of the Son of God. And they came to believe in Jesus, their Savior, God, do the same merciful, gracious work for you and me. We have experienced his death and resurrection and baptism. As often as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we proclaim his death until he comes. And we rejoice in the many festivals of the resurrection every Sunday that Jesus is living. And because he lives, we will live also. In Jesus' name, amen.